Thank you, Brother Bourne. On behalf of our family, I get to speak first, and so I get to say thank you first. Everything else you'll hear, see, will be a recording from me. But we do appreciate the way you've chosen to honor our Father. I think He's very deserving. We look forward to the lunch hour where he will, he will receive that honor, and we get to speak again, and hopefully we'll share some things that are uh, dear to us at the same time, maybe share a few things about Him you don't know. And uh, so Dan and I have talked, and Tim and I have talked. We have a younger brother who's not a minister. He's a uh, physician in Tuscaloosa, so he couldn't come. But I have something he's written, and he wanted me to share it too. And so we look forward to that time together. It's been almost 15 years since I've been here. Lots of things happened in 15 years. Number one, I got better looking. <laughs> My hair is shorter. I heard that y'all looked at some pictures from years gone by and we all look like hippies. But uh, our children have grown up. I have a daughter, it's hard to believe, that's getting married this year. And I have children, other children in high school. And uh, it's just hard to believe how life passes us by. I look at, out and I see friends that we established here 15, 18, 20 years ago. I see people that I knew since I was a little, little boy. When we moved here when I was 10 years old. And uh, I appreciate your support. I appreciate you being here. It's fun to look back and to reminisce and to hear about all the bad things you did when you were a little boy and they just still don't hold it against you. And uh, I told somebody I have to stay on the east side of the Mississippi because I was such a rascal as a teenager, I couldn't work with the people in Fort Worth, Texas. They knew me too well. And, uh, but we uh, appreciate the invitation. We enjoy being here. Integrity. It's been described as an uphill marathon. Someone else said that integrity is not something once taught, forever caught. And yet, the Bible repeatedly encourages us by direct statement, as well as by example, that we are to be men and women of integrity. David said in Psalms 26, verse 11, that as for me, I will walk in my integrity. The psalmist said in the 41st chapter, the 12th verse, that God upholdeth him in his integrity. And then in the 101st psalm, again the psalmist tells us that I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. God expects us to be men and women of integrity. But what is integrity? It's a word that's thrown around a lot in our society today, and yet I think many times we uh, don't quite understand the magnitude of the term. The word integrity itself has a Latin heritage. It comes from the word integer. Mathematically, we all understand that the word integer is a whole number. It's a complete number, such as number five, number 12, maybe 133. Its counterpart is a fraction. And so as we talk about the concept of integrity, integrity, we could define integrity as the state of not being divided or not being fragmented. If you look in Webster in his Seventh Collegiate Dictionary, you'll find this definition. It's an unimpaired condition soundness. His third definition under integrity is the quality or state of being complete or undivided. But I think Jesus best defines the term for us from a biblical standpoint in the Sermon on the Mount when he said that we cannot serve two masters. For we will either love one and hate the other, or we'll either hold one and despises the other, but you cannot be divided. You cannot serve God and mammon. And so as we talk about integrity, the first thing we want to understand is what do we mean by integrity? And that is we're talking about that state of being, that part of our character that is not divided. It understands its commitments, it understands its loyalties to whom they belong, and that's God. 
But as we talk about integrity this morning, we want to do basically two things with it. We won't follow the outline of the book completely. But we're going to look at, first of all, some areas where we today need to be men and women of integrity. And then number two, we're going to look at the importance of it in our lives as Christians today. But let's first of all look at some areas where we need to be men and women of integrity. Now, because of the limitation of time, we know we can't make a long list of things where we need to be men and women of integrity. But I'd like to suggest two of, the, uh, two of them today to us to consider. First of all, we need to be men and women of integrity when it comes to our words. God again has expected. In fact, God demands today that we always speak the truth. Paul told the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 4 that they were to lay aside all falsehood and they were to speak the truth to each other. When he wrote the Colossian church, he said in chapter 3 verse 9, do not lie to one another. When Solomon wrote his Proverbs in the 13th chapter, the 5th verse, he said that a righteous man hates falsehood. But then he tells us also in the 6th chapter of Proverbs that there are six things that God hates. Seven are an abomination. And in that list is a lying tongue. And so today we need to strive to be men and women who are true to our words. Why? Because God expects it. Because God demands it. But also we need to be men and women who are true to our word because we want to be like God. My children are a little older now, and their aspirations to imitate dad aren't quite as strong as they were when they were real little. But when they, when they were little, you would walk around and you'd see one of your children in your shoes. Or if you had a pair of cowboy boots, which I have, you would see your son wearing your boots, and they'd come up to his growing, trying to be just like you. Want to wear a tie like you wore a tie. Want to dress like you dressed. They want to be like their dads. You'd hear someone say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you'd hear, I want to be like my daddy. Well, from a father's standpoint, that's pretty humbling. It's pretty frightening to know that you're being scrutinized like that. But we're children. And our aspiration, our desire should be that we want to be like our father. And Paul told Titus in Titus the first chapter, the second verse, that it's impossible for what? For God not to speak the truth. It's impossible for God to lie. And so today we need to be men and women of integrity when it comes to our speech so we can be just like our Father. But then third of all, we need to be men and women who are true in speech because the Bible again warns us over and over and over again that those who choose, and I want to underscore the word choose, it's a choice. Those who choose not to be men and women of integrity will have to face judgment condemned. When John wrote his revelation in the 21st chapter, the 8th verse, he said that all liars, everyone who doesn't speak the truth, will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so as we evaluate ourselves, and that's hopefully the purpose of our being together this morning, as we evaluate ourselves in the light of Scripture, we've got to ask ourselves, be it preacher, elder, whoever we are, am I being true in word? But then second of all, let me suggest to us that we need to be true in character. The Hindus have a story of a man who owned a donkey. And he would dress his donkey in the skin of a lion. And then he would turn his lion out into a field rich with barley. Well, when the villagers would see this supposed lion, they would run in fear and vacate the field and the donkey could graze unmolested. Well, the villagers realized that they're going to, they'd have to put a stop to this. And so they mustered up enough courage within themselves to try to frighten away this beast. And so the day it came back into their field, they decided to make a lot of noise. And they began to blow on some horns and beat on some drums to scare away this beast. And the beast cried out in fear. 
but it wasn't the cry of a lion. It was the cry of a donkey. And when the villagers heard it, they immediately turned on that beast and killed him. The Bible teaches us as children of God that it is imperative. It is imperative that we strive to be genuine in character and not a hypocrite. What is a hypocrite? Well, a hypocrite has been described as a person who is split. It's a split person. You see, outwardly, visually, he's one thing. But inwardly, he's something completely different. And you know, hypocrisy is something that God's people have had to fight and have had to deal with in their lives for all times. I think one of the best illustrations of that is found in the book of John, the 12th chapter. It has to do with one of Jesus' own chosen, Judas. You know the story. Mary's come in and she has anointed the body of Jesus for His crucifixion. And she has done it with a very expensive form of perfume or oil. When Judas sees this supposed wastage, he rebukes her and says, why wasn't this perfume sold and then the money given to the poor? You see, outwardly he was projecting an image of benevolence. Outwardly, he was projecting a concern for those who are less fortunate. But the Bible gives this little appendix to the story. The Bible says Judas said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. Outwardly, he looked so good. He said the right things. He projected the right image. And people were impressed with it. But inwardly, he was completely different. He was a split person. Today, as always, God wants us to be genuine. In fact, Jesus challenges us to be genuine. You recall in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, The first three verses, Jesus says, speaking of the Pharisees, He says, whatever they tell you to do, do it. But, He said, don't do like they do. Because they say, and yet don't do it. And then from there, He begins to pronounce some woes to the Pharisees. And if you have your Bibles, flip with me please to the 23rd chapter. And look with me at uh, verse 25 through 28. Well, let's just start with 27 because of time. He says, Woe to you, scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside they appear beautiful. But he says, On the inside, you're full of dead men's bones, and you're full of all uncleanliness. Even so, you too outwardly appear to be righteous, but inwardly, You're full of hypocrisies and lawlessness. Here's the picture. You've got people who are religious and who are projecting the proper image. They're saying the right things. They're acting the right way. And visually, outwardly, people are impressed. But inwardly, they're empty. Inwardly, there's no substance to them. Inwardly, they're unclean. And so Jesus tells us in the fifth chapter of Matthew, the 20th verse, that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, it's a challenge in life to be a man of integrity. It's a challenge in life to be a person who is genuine. It's easy to play games. It's easy to wear masks. But it's a challenge to be genuine. But as we continue, we've defined what we meant by integrity. 
We've looked at just two areas where we need to apply the concept of integrity in our lives, but let's look at the value of it. Let's look at the importance of it in our lives. Let me suggest to us, first of all, this morning, that we need to be men and women of integrity because integrity is extremely, extremely revealing. You know, life isn't easy when you're over, overshadowed by a sibling. Especially if that sibling happens to be famous, such as Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, of course, we know, is a very popular singer with the young people. He comes from a very large family of entertainers. Both his brothers and his sisters are very prominent entertainers. He has a sister that's two years older than him named LaToya. LaToya in herself is an entertainer. She's cut some albums, she's made a few music videos, but she has never received the recognition and she has never received the prominence of the rest of her siblings. That is until a few years ago. You see, in January the 27th, 1989, she was interviewed by the USA Today newspaper. And in that newspaper, she bore her soul to the nation. And then after that, she later bore everything else to Playboy magazine. Well, the newspaper came back, and they wanted to know why. Why would someone with your background, someone with your name, someone with your prestige, do something such as posing nude? I think her response to that is very revealing about her character. I'd like to quote, if I could, from the uh, newspaper. She said, and I quote, I look at the human body as a work of art. I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of. In America, we've been covered for so many years. If we bear something, it's a disgrace. But it really isn't. End of quote. Now what's interesting about that is when Playboy magazine approached LaToya Jackson in July of 1987, she makes this statement. She said, when I was first approached, I said, absolutely not. I'm not that kind of girl. And we applaud her. But the paper goes ahead and says that Playboy countered with another offer and increased the ante. And she says, and again I quote, when the magazine offered more money, we investigated. And then I realized that there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Integrity is revealing. That's why David resolved in his heart whether he was out in public or whether he was in private. He would walk in the integrity of his heart. But second of all, we want to ask a question. Today, in our fast-paced world, and in our highly competitive society, and I might put in a parenthesis there, the highly competitive church at times, is it possible? Is it really possible? Or is there of any value to be a man or a woman of integrity? When I hear that inquiry, I think about it, and I have to respond with a resounding yes. There is value to being a man or a woman of integrity. Someone says, why? Brethren, when we choose, and again, the emphasis there is choose, it's choice. When we choose to walk in integrity, when we choose to live our life genuine, when we choose not to live a life that's divided in loyalty and in commitments, when we choose to live a life of integrity, we live life with confidence. And I think we have confidence in three different ways. If you have your Bibles, turn back with me to Job, the second chapter. I think, first of all, that when we choose to walk in our integrity, the first thing that happens is that we have the trust and we have the confidence of God. 
In Job chapter 2, look with me if you would please at verse 3. Here's God talking with Satan. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on the earth. He's blameless. He's upright. He fears God and he turns away from evil. And he still holds fast his integrity. Although you, talking to Satan, although you incited me against him to ruin him without a cause. In spite of what Satan did, in spite of how he was inflicted with uh, pain, physical and emotional, financial and relational, in spite of the hurt that he felt, he did not divide his loyalties. And because of it, he had God's trust. He had God's confidence. We step back, we look at that, we read that, and we think, could God say that about me? Does God have that kind of trust and confidence in me? But not only did Job have the trust and confidence of God, but Job also possessed a tremendous confidence in himself. Stay in the book of Job with me and flip over to chapter 27. Here he's had one of his friends talk to him. His name is Bildad. In the 26th and 27th chapter, Job responds to what Bildad has said. And listen to verse 5 and 6. He says, Far be it from me that I should declare you right. Until I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and I will not let it go. My heart does not reproach any of my days. You see, he looked at life and he lived life with confidence because he knew that where his loyalties were. He knew how his life had been lived and he knew it had been a life of commitment of not divided loyalties. So not only does he have God's confidence and trust, he has confidence in himself. Do we? Do we have confidence in ourselves? When you turn your Bibles now to the book of Psalms, the seventh chapter, David talks again about integrity and what it does for him. And because of his integrity, David could anticipate and face the judgment of God without fear. He says, vindicate me, O Lord. Judge me according to my righteousness. Vindicate me. Judge me according to the integrity that is in me. You see, when I make a choice in life to commit my life to Christ and to give Him my loyalties and not live a divided life, not try to straddle that fence, I know God believes in me, I believe in myself, and I have nothing to fear. We call that security. And that's what Christianity offers mankind when mankind will live a life of integrity. But as we go on, we'll see that it's also important to live a life of integrity because a life of integrity enhances our relationship with God. You know, Paul talked about counting everything that he had gained in life as rubbish, as garbage, because he wanted to know God. The word know in that particular text, we all know is gnosko. If you do a little work on this word, you'll find that it carries the idea of a relationship. It's not just knowing something and that's it. It's having a relationship with something. And so Paul was willing to count everything in life as garbage so that he could have a relationship with God. Brethren, when I walk in my integrity, my integrity enhances that gift. David asked the question, O Lord, O Lord, who can abide in thy tent? God, who can dwell on thy holy hill? Verse 1. Listen to the first part of verse 2. The answer. 
He who walks in his integrity. You see, integrity enhances relationships with God. And so the proverb says that God is a shield to those who walk in integrity. But in passing, let me mention two or three other important reasons why we need to be men and women of integrity. Let me suggest to you, first of all, that when we are men and women of integrity, we have a good guide for life. You see, if I choose to live life divided, if I just decide to divide my, to divide my loyalties two ways, who am I going to follow? And when am I going to follow them? If I choose to divide them four ways, when and who am I going to follow and how do I know that's the right time to do it? But when I live a life that is not divided, when I live a life that is complete, that is one of integrity, then I have a reliable guide for life. Listen to what Solomon said in Proverbs 11. The integrity of the upright will guide them. But not only do we have a good guide, a reliable guide, but we also have, or it also allows us to live life with security. You know, as our children were young and we pillowed their heads at night and kissed them goodnight, I do not remember one time any of my children getting up to check the front door. You know why? They were secure. They knew that their father would take care of that. And brethren, when I live a life of integrity, doing what God wants me to do, doing what God says to do, and I don't divide my loyalty, my life as a child of God is lived with security. And we need to pray like we're men and women with security. We're not teaching once saved, always saved. But we're not teaching either living a life of uncertainty and doubt. God says that a child of God who walks in integrity walks securely. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 9. And we need not to pray, when I die, if I have lived right, take me to heaven. Brethren, we know if we've lived right. If we've done everything we know to do according to what God has said to do to the best of our abilities, we have dedicated ourselves to Him. We have not lived divided. We can live securely. And we need to live like that as gospel preachers so we can pass it on to those whom we preach to. But then last of all, it's important for me to live a life of integrity because it gives me the opportunity to pass on to my children a rich, rich legacy. Let's go back to Proverbs again. Solomon says in chapter 20, verse 7, that a righteous man who walks in his integrity, how blessed, how blessed are his children who follow him. I give my children a heritage. I give my children a legacy that will guide them after I'm gone. His name is Dr. Evan O'Neill Kane. He was 62 years old when he served as a chief of surgery in the Kane Summit Hospital in New York City. Dr. Kane was convinced that most of the major operations being done at that time could be done under local anesthesia, thereby enhancing recu uh, uh, the recuperation process as opposed to general anesthesia. But no one would buy into the theory. And so to prove his point, on February the 15th, 1921, Dr. Kane operated on himself, and he removed his appendix while under local anesthesia. The surgery, very successful. His recuperation process was much more rapid than those who had had the same surgery, though under general anesthesia. The results? Another major medical breakthrough. This morning I'd like to challenge all of us 
to operate on ourselves. Not physically, of course, but spiritually. I like to call this surgery self-exploratory surgery of the soul. And using the germ-free scalpel of God's Word, I'd like us to evaluate. And I'd like us to determine the condition of our integrity. And ask ourselves, am I walking in integrity?